I told Eddie that my introduction of him would be brief, so our speaker at this time is Eddie Parrish. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the privilege and joy of knowing Eddie and working with him for the last several years. And uh, I count it just that as a privilege and a joy uh, to be able to be a co-laborer here at this congregation with Eddie and, of course, Maxie and Mark, uh, and the many great works that are being done by this fine congregation. Eddie and I have a good working relationship. I first came to the school December the 1st in 2003 as the director, and he and I uh, began to work together uh, in the school. And about a week later, uh, we had a meeting with uh, the elders. And the elders asked us how things were going, and I remember saying, well, we've got a problem. And they said, well, what's the problem? And I said, well, Eddie and I are finishing one another's sentences. <laughs> As such, we have, I believe, melded together uh, over the years. Eddie is a few days younger than I, but nevertheless, <laughs> we find ourselves uh, having the opportunity to be able to serve this congregation. Eddie, of course, is the a located preacher for the congregation here at Brown Trail, and he also uh, is the speaker for the Truth and Love television program, a work that has been going on for a large number of years and that has accomplished much good uh, for the sake of the kingdom of God, not only here in this area, but in many other areas. It's always good to be able to be with Eddie wherever it might be. Uh, it's always good to have an opportunity to hear uh, the lessons that Eddie brings because they will be sound uh, they will be to the point, they will be clear, they will be understandable. Uh, when Eddie is finished, there'll be no question at all as to what he had to say. And I appreciate the good work that he and his wife Mary, who is the secre secretary for the congregation here, and also their two sons as they labor together with this congregation. Eddie. I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I honestly believe that, uh, that I am the blessed one uh, to be able to be here and uh, labor in the kingdom with uh, such a wonderful group of people, uh, including uh, the other individuals that are on the staff here, Bob included, and Mark, and Maxie, and, and others, but uh, to labor with a congregation that uh, treats me far, far better than I deserve. Amen. And... Uh, <laughs> That, dear friends, was one of my elders. <laughs> I am so biting my tongue right now. <clears throat> Stephen was a man of exceptional character. He was an individual of wisdom, a man of great faith, a man full of the Spirit, Acts chapter 6, verses 3 and 5. These are characteristics that placed him right alongside six others of the same character. They had been chosen to alleviate a problem that had arisen in the early years of the church. But in addition to that work, his benevolent work, which is the nature of, of the problem that had arisen, in addition to that work among the Hellenistic Jews, Stephen, full of grace and power, Acts 6 verse 8, preached to and worked miracles among the people. But his work was not always accepted. We're told as we continue to read through chapter 6 of the book of Acts that some began to argue and dispute with him. Those of the synagogue of the freedmen, probably a group of former Jewish slaves. And they disputed with Stephen about the things that he was saying, but we're told in verse 10 of Acts 6 they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. 
And so his antagonists could not answer what he was saying. They had no legitimate counter to the message that he was presenting. And so, as is sometimes the case, when one cannot answer the logical argumentation, they resort to dishonesty. And the Bible says that they stirred up privately certain individuals who were willing to claim that Stephen had committed blasphemy. And this unscrupulous mob accused him of that and ended up dragging him before the Sanhedrin to stand trial on that charge. Acts chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. And Stephen's defense before that grand council stands even to this day as one of the greatest apologetic sermons ever spoken. And we want to give it due consideration this afternoon. We're going to look at Stephen's sermon from four perspectives, from four points of view. We will first of all consider history. Then we will look at it from God's perspective. We will look at it from the perspective of or in consideration of the council. And then we will consider Stephen himself. And so let us begin, first of all, by our consideration of history. Because in this sermon, Stephen spends the greatest amount of his time calling attention to important events that took place in Israel's history. Let's briefly summarize them and call your attention to the text uh, that specifically mentions it. First of all, he begins by, by referencing the call and the sojourning of Abraham. This in verses 2 through 8. Specifically, if you'll notice verse 4, he says that he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. From there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And he continues from that to discuss Joseph and his family being moved to Egypt. That in verses 9 through 16. From there, Stephen changes uh, his, um, uh, his historical record to move to Moses and deals first with his birth and early years, verses 17 through 22. He then discusses Moses and his years, his 40 years in Midian, verses 23 through 29. He then recounts the Exodus the giving of the law, and the incident involving the golden calf. Verses 30 through 43. He speaks briefly of Joshua, David, and Solomon in verses 44 through 50, and then concludes by drawing attention to the consistent treatment of the prophets throughout their history. Verses 51 through 53, and that would include and did include their treatment of Jesus, the prophet. And what we find as we think about this historical record and the point that Stephen was ultimately driving at was that their own history was replete with examples of faithlessness, examples of disobedience, and examples of outright defiance and rebellion. When I read through Stephen's sermon, and especially how he concludes it in verses 51 to 53, I can't help but be reminded of the Lord's words from the 23rd chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse number 29. Listen to what Jesus said to His contemporaries. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets 
wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus indicted His contemporaries by calling into question their own attitudes about themselves. When they, recognizing the history that Stephen would present, that throughout it, Their people had been known for persecuting the prophets. As those same people looked back on that, they could not deny what their ancestors had done. They only piously stood up in that day and said, well, if we had lived back then, we would not have treated the prophets that way. If we had lived back in those days of the prophets, we would not have treated them as they did and spilled their blood. Jesus said, you you only testify against yourselves. Why was that? Because they were at that very moment scheming, putting together a plot to take down and kill the prophet, Jesus himself, the one who was going to come in the likeness of Moses. And so when he said to them, go ahead and fill up the measure of your father's guilt... That's what he had reference to. You've already set your heart and your mind to kill me. And by doing so, you're going to fill up finally the measure of the guilt of your own ancestors that you say you would not have acted like, but you're acting like them right now in the way you're treating me. And it was that attitude that Stephen addresses in his sermon as he marches them through a history lesson. And then he lowers the boom on them at the end. And that's our consideration of history. Now for a moment, let us consider God. Let's look at Stephen's sermon from the perspective of God's involvement. You see, in each one of those historical events, and in each one of those circumstances involving the individuals that Stephen mentioned, God was actively showing His care, His concern, and His love for Israel. Let's go back and look at them. When you consider Abraham, that's where Stephen began, with God calling Abraham from his homeland and bringing him to the land of Canaan, A land that he never owned himself, but that was promised and given to his descendants. When you think about God's calling of Abraham, we are forced to admit that it was an act of pure grace that God selected Abraham and his descendants to be the vehicle through which the Messiah would come. It was an act of grace that God chose anyone for that. God was under no obligation to mankind to come up with a plan to redeem mankind from His sins. God did not owe that to us. God created that plan in eternity because of His love and His compassion and His mercy. And so when that plan begins to be carried out in history, and Abraham playing a part in that plan, it's evidence of God's divine compassion and grace and mercy. That was God's involvement in that part of Stephen's sermon. But what about Joseph? Stephen mentions Joseph in verses 9 through 16, but God's involvement in that is that it was God in the days of Joseph who was providing for Abraham's descendants, preserving them from famine. That's why Joseph ended up in Egypt to begin with. God, knowing what was going to take place, was getting Joseph into a place in which he could be instrumental in saving his people from the devastating famine. And Joseph, after all was said and done, after the hatred of his brothers who sold him into slavery and after the events involving 
uh, his jail time because of Potiphar's wife and all of those things, when all of it was said and done and his brothers are now in Egypt, he looked back on it and said, Genesis 45 verse 5, God sent me before you to preserve your lives. That was God's involvement. And he would tell his brothers in Genesis 50 verse 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God was involved. What about Moses? Stephen mentions Moses, that God raised up Moses to be the deliverer for His people. It was God who was preparing Moses to be that instrument. The one to deliver the Hebrews from the bondage and cruelty of a Pharaoh who arose who knew not Joseph. That was God's part. And as we continue looking at the, the emphasis in Stephen's history lesson. As we consider the exodus and the giving of the law that Stephen mentions, what were those events? God keeping His promises. God keeping His promise to His people to bring them out of bondage, giving them a law to govern them, to try to keep them from annihilating themselves so that He could fulfill His promise to bring the Messiah into the world. Joshua, who led them in conquest into the land. Stephen mentions Joshua. What was God's role in that? Well, it was God giving them that which He had promised. God fulfilling His promise. Through David and Solomon, God was active in seeing the kingdom to be uh, being expanded. And every time a prophet was sent among them, that was God at work trying to give them much needed direction and instruction. And so as Stephen is given a, giving a history lesson, yes, it's that, but it's more than that. Because in that history lesson is evidence being presented that God, through all of that, continued to show His compassion, continued to show His mercy, continued to show His grace to His people by continuing to keep His promises, fulfill His Word, give them direction and guidance. And yet, how did the people respond to all of those instances throughout history that Stephen is calling attention to? Look what God did. Look what God did. Look what God did. What kind of response did God receive? Well, Joseph, raised up by God, but initially rejected by his own kinsmen, rejected by his own brothers. Nevertheless, before all was said and done, Joseph would deliver his brothers, though they rejected him initially. Moses, raised up by God, but rejected. Rejected by his own kinsmen. Stephen drawing attention to the fact that even though Moses at the time he stood up for his brother that was being mistreated, he thought at that time that the people would be ready to follow him. They weren't. They rejected him. <coughs> Nevertheless, ultimately, it was Moses who delivered his brethren, though they rejected him. Eventually, the implication is going to be the same with Jesus. God raised him up. Rejected initially by his brethren. He came unto his own, his own received him not, John 1.11. And if those people were ever going to be delivered, it was going to be through Jesus. How did they respond throughout history? Though God led them out of Egypt, showing them over and over again his miraculous power, at practically every turn they saw evidence of God's power, Yet the people turned back to idols. Almost immediately after the crossing of the Red Sea and that momentous event where the people saw with their own eyes the power of God and how God was determined to free them from bondage, they turn around and say, make us a captain to take us back to Egypt. Though given a bountiful and prosperous land, they eventually turned from God and served idols 
Though the prophets would come in among them to try to turn them from their idolatry, they would have none of it. And then most recently to that group, God had sent His own Son. But the listeners there, Stephen's listeners, treated Jesus no better than their forefathers had treated the other prophets. That was God's part. Doing all of those things for those people throughout history. And that was God's thanks. Let's take a moment for a side point. Can we fathom, really, is it possible for our finite minds to fathom the depth of God's goodness, of His mercy, His love, His patience, that though at every turn God blessed His people in some measure, God honored them by giving them instruction and guidance and sending them prophets and doing all of these things to keep His promises, and at every turn they rejected Him, and yet He did not wipe them off the face of the earth. Can we fathom the depth of God's patience and long-suffering? How His mercies can be new Every morning, Lamentations 3.23, I do not know, but they are. In Isaiah 65, verse 2, he said, All day long I have stretched out my hand to a wicked and rebellious people. Matthew 5, verse 45 reminds us that God still causes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. The sun rises for the benefit of the good and the evil. David Hester, in his lesson last night, drew attention to men like Richard Dawkins, Hitchens, and others. Men who got up this morning with probably a singular goal in their mind to try to convince as many people as they can that there is no God. But they arose... The sunlight provided them by God. The rain waters their lawns as much as it does yours. Now that doesn't mean that all of God's blessings are dispensed that way. They aren't. Some blessings are safeguarded only for those that are willing to submit to God and be obedient to Him. But there are some blessings that are given to folks without regard to their spiritual condition. And that's why Jesus said in that context, You love your enemies. And do good to those that mistreat you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven who treats His enemies that way. Can we fathom the depth of God's mercy? But what about us? God has blessed us in more ways than we can count. We have health. We have houses in which to live that will keep us warm on days like today that will cool us off in the blistering summers of Texas. We have cars that will get us from one place to another. We have computers, we have jobs, we have families. And beyond that, we've been blessed with salvation from our sins, the power and privilege of prayer. We have the Bible in the language that we can study it ourselves and read it for ourselves. We have the fellowship of brethren. He's blessed us in more ways than we can count, and yet we can be, and I say we because I include myself, we can sometimes be the gripiest, most ungrateful, negative, complaining people around. In direct violation of Philippians 2.14, which says, Do all things without grumbling or complaining. But what does God do? In the midst of all of our ingratitude, what does He do? He keeps blessing us. He still holds out a loving and welcoming hand if we would only turn from those sinful attitudes and develop attitudes that are more in tune with who He is. The God we serve today is no different than the God they served then. And God continued to hold His hand out to them. He continued to bless them in so many ways, yet they continued to turn their backs on Him. God deserves better than that. 
Now in the third place, let's consider the council. Let's look at this event with regard to their involvement. We're talking, of course, about the Sanhedrin. The term Sanhedrin means literally to sit together. And it was a word that actually could be used in reference to any court or legal assembly. As a matter of fact, when Jesus issued what we usually refer to as the limited commission, Matthew chapter 10, He told uh, His disciples there that they would be taken before councils. That word councils is the plural of Sanhedrin. So it was used sometimes in reference to even lower courts. But most of the time in the New Testament, it referenced that highest court, the supreme court, we might say, of the Jews. One that consisted of 70 men plus the high priest who presided over it. And it was distinguished from those lower courts many times by it being called the great Sanhedrin. But here was Stephen's assessment of them. Verses 51 to 53. He said, first of all, you are stiff-necked, stubborn, bullheaded. He said, you are uncircumcised in heart and ears. He means by that that their connection to Abraham was only physical and nothing else. It was not a spiritual connection. Abraham always listened to God and was obedient to God. You people never are. And so you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. You see, the only connection to Abraham that matters is the spiritual connection. Romans 2.28, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. The circumcision that avails is not the circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, paraphrasing verses 28 and 29 of Romans chapter 2. Paul would write, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3.29 Abraham listened to and was faithful to God. The men on the council were not. He describes them as being resistant to the Holy Spirit. Just as the Spirit spoke through the prophets in the past, only to be resisted by their forefathers, the same was true in the days of Jesus and the apostles. They resisted His Word, the Spirit's Word. They resisted the Spirit's miracles that were being done to confirm that Word. They were persecutors of the prophets. He said, just as your forefathers had killed the prophets that predicted the coming of Christ, you're guilty of killing the Christ that they predicted. And the blistering question in that context that he asks them, which of the fathers or which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Name me one, he wanted to know. And they were disobedient. He spoke of them as being the ones who had been given the law but had not kept it. That was the council. And their reaction to Stephen proved that his assessment was right on target. When they ran at him, grabbed him, gnashed on him with their teeth, took him out, and stoned him to death was the indication that what he said of them was exactly right. Now let's consider Stephen. What are some characteristics of Stephen that come to us from Acts chapter 7? Well, I would say in the first place, he viewed history properly. He viewed history properly. When Stephen looked back at history, he saw God's activity in the world. But not just God's activity in the world, it was activity that was intended to teach lessons. And that was something that God had, has tried to build into our consciousness. You go back and read through the Old Testament especially, you'll find that God wanted over and over and over again for people, number one, to remember history, and number two, to remember it as God's activity in His own world. That's why you have passages like Exodus 12, 26, where at the time the Passover was instituted, God said, when your children ask you in years to come what this means, then you tell them. You tell them about my work, my activity in the world as I brought you out of bondage. You get to Joshua chapter 4 verse 21 when they crossed the Jordan and they built this stone monument with stones taken from that dried up river. 
Joshua said, when your children ask you in time to come, what do these stones mean? You tell them, God brought us into this land. That's why you have passages like Psalm 44, verse 1, where the psalmist said, O oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days in the days of old. Folks, let me encourage all of us not to be guilty of separating history from Bible history as if those two things are from different worlds, one real and one fantasy. It's all God's history. What about Stephen? He proclaimed the Word of God without respect of persons. It mattered not one whit to Stephen that these men on that council had the ability to and a history of getting Rome to do their dirty work for them. Isn't that what they did with Jesus? Stephen knew that as well as anybody. It mattered not to him. He proclaimed the word of God to them without respect of persons. Number three, with regard to Stephen, he did not preach vague generalities, but he preached concrete specifics. Some preachers fail in that today. They're willing to preach vague generalities, Let's all obey God. Let's all be like Jesus. Well, in and of itself, those are perfectly good admonitions. But what does it mean to be obedient to God? What does it mean to be like Jesus? Living today in the 21st century, how does that general admonition apply into the concrete specifics of my own life? If we don't ever get down to that business... Are we really doing our job? What about Stephen? He chose death over compromise. He chose death over compromise. Some of us aren't even willing to live for Jesus, much less die for Him. In the next place, Stephen loved his enemies. Think about that for a moment. In verse 60, Stephen expressed his desire to Jesus that these individuals be given time and opportunity to repent, that this sin might not be laid to their charge. That's love for your enemies. But notice that, that that's not a different Stephen in verse 60 than existed in verses 51 to 53 when he called them stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, resistant to the Holy Spirit. All those things that he said, those were not unloving things to say. He was trying to wake those men up to reality. And so, because he loved them, he tried to turn them around. And even at a time when it was very clear that they weren't willing to do that, he prayed for their forgiveness. And in the last place with regard to Stephen, this, if you'll allow me to jump ahead to chapter 8, verse 2, we learn that Stephen left a void in the hearts of the faithful. When he died, he left a void in the hearts of the faithful. The text says, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. I think it's interesting and not accidental that the text says great lamentation was made by devout men. I suspect that those that were unfaithful, those that were worldly, could not have cared less about the death of Stephen. That was obviously the case in the lives of those that were bouncing rocks off his body. But there were others too, I suspect, that did not have a direct part in the death of Stephen, 
that still it mattered very little to them that Stephen was no longer there. But in the hearts of devout men, a great void was left. I think about preachers that I look up to that have had in some measure an influence on my life that are no longer here. Who have left behind a great void in the lives of a lot of people. Think about Tom Warren, William Woodson, Wendell Winkler, Roy Deaver, Guy Woods, Johnny Ramsey, Avon Malone. Make your list. Men who are no longer here that left great voids in the hearts of devout individuals. And I suspect that there are many people in this world that never heard of those guys. And there are a lot of people who knew who they were that, again, might have cared very little that those men passed from this life. But they left a void in the hearts of the devout. George Jones had a song out a number of years ago titled, Who's Gonna Fill Their Shoes? A song that talked about all of the uh, old individuals in country music that had died. And he asked the question, who's going to come along and fill their shoes? Do you know in the grand scheme of things, it matters not one whit if not another country music song is ever written, played, or sung. But when great gospel preachers go to their reward and leave a void in the hearts of a grateful brotherhood, we cannot fail to ask the same question, who is going to fill their shoes? And someone has to answer that question. Who will it be? David Hester? Bud Woodall, Tommy Haynes, Pat McIntosh, Willie Alvaringa, Alan Tillman, Doyle Bruce. Who's going to fill their shoes? Jesus promised his followers. They would not always be liked. Paul said the same thing. 2 Timothy 3.12 Peter did too. 1 Peter 4.12-16 The time may come, God forbid, when the persecution that comes our way will go beyond today's verbal ridicule and more resemble yesterday's physical abuse and murder. If it does, may God grant us the spirit of Stephen that we would be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, knowing full well that a crown of life awaits us on the other side. Thank you.